welcome to today's live Zoo to You. I'm Katie, one of the educators here at Stone Zoo, and today we are so excited to be celebrating a really special day. Today is World Bee Day. So we're going to be talking all about our honey beehive here at Stone Zoo. If you have any questions during the chat, please feel free to ask them in the comment section and we will do our best to answer them towards the end. So before I begin, I want to start by taking some guesses. I want to see if anyone watching at home has a guess as to how many bees we have in our hive here. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about them. I'll give everyone a chance to get their guesses in and then we will reveal how many roughly that we have. So a honeybee hive, these are European honeybees, is comprised of three different types of bees. First, we're going to talk about our worker bees and we're gonna zoom in so we can see them nice and close. Worker bees are the majority. They are all females and they all have different jobs within the hive. So some worker bees are in charge of flying out of the hive and collecting nectar and pollen. In fact, those bees can produce around one twelfth of a teaspoon of pollen in their lifetime. So it shows you, oh, I'm sorry, of honey in their lifetime. So it shows you how many bees it takes to produce honey that you buy at the grocery store or at a farmer's market. So those bees will fly a couple miles each day collecting nectar and pollen and they can reach speeds of around 15 miles per hour, which is pretty fast. So next we have, oh, and you know what? Let's take this opportunity to look at some of our different workers. So we can see some of them are building honeycomb. Honeycomb is used to store honey. It's also where they'll, uh, the queen will lay her eggs, their brood. And so nurse bees, which is a type of worker bee, will go in and take care of the young. And some are in charge of building that honeycomb structure as well. And they build that structure using a special gland on their abdomen. And that is what produces the beeswax. So they'll secrete the beeswax out of that and then nurse bees in charge of feeding the young, we'll see if we can find any of our brood, have a special gland on their head. It looks like there's some brood in there. We might be able to see them. They have a special gland on their head that produces something called royal jelly. It's this white substance and it is fed to young bees for their first few days of development. Um, it's really high in protein and B vitamins, but it's fed to queen bees, which we'll talk about in just a minute, through their entire developmental period, which is around 16 days. And that's what makes the queen bees bigger than worker bees. You can see little tiny larva in there. And I do have a replica just so we can see up close. This is what a bee larva will look like. Obviously this is much bigger. So they look like a little worm and then they will turn into a pupa. And then 21 days later, a, an adult bee will emerge. So our next type of bee we have in here are the drones. And I don't see any drones right now, but those are male bees. They have really big eyeballs and that's so they can spot queens of other hives and they don't participate in the upkeep of the hive at all. Their only job is to eat and to mate with queens of other hives. So because of that, once autumn comes and we, the weather starts getting cooler, food becomes less abundant for bees, the drones are the first to get kicked out of the hive. But right now we can actually see this worker bee She's got some little lumps on her legs and those are pollen packs. So they'll pack on pollen on their legs and bring it back to the hive, which is really cool. And then we'll see down here, if we could take a look at this bee, looks like some interesting behavior. That is called the waggle dance and that's how worker bees will communicate to each other. So they'll shake their abdomen and do a figure eight shape. The number of shakes that they do Here's one right there. Indicates how far away food is and the direction in which they're facing indicates where that food or water source is. So that's how they'll communicate to each other, which is really cool. It'd be really interesting if humans communicated with dance, but that's something really cool and unique about honeybees. 
And then while we're on this side of our beehive, we can take a look at this really cool feature that our worker bees are constructing right now. So this cell is really big and it's bigger than all the other cells. And that's because it is a queen cell for a future queen. So that cell's bigger, it's still being constructed, but we're assuming that our queen is getting ready to lay eggs that will become another queen. So the nurse bees will give that larva uh, lots of royal jelly for 16 days, and then a new queen will emerge. And beehives only have one queen per hive, so that means our hive is going to swarm and split. And a lot of times people have these negative ideas about swarming. It doesn't mean the bees are being super aggressive. It just means that their hive is really big and it's time for them to split up and to form two separate hives. So it's just how hives grow. So we're assuming that's what's going to be happening with our hive soon. And then we'll take a look over on this side because earlier we did spot our queen. Sometimes it does take us a minute to find her. She is around one and a half times bigger than all of the worker bees. And she actually has a green dot on her back right now, which makes it a little bit easier to find her, but not super easy. As you can see, we just saw her around five minutes ago and we're already not having the best of luck. Um, sometimes you can see the worker bees, they kind of always surround her, just protecting her and keeping her safe. And she's been really busy laying eggs. So she can lay around 200,000 eggs in her lifetime. And she's the only bee that's going to do any reproduction in the hive. Um, all of the other bees kind of just serve her. There are some bees that will clean her and bring her food and she is in charge of laying all of the eggs, which is really cool. She also does not have a barbed stinger. All of the worker bees have barbed stingers, which means that they can only sting once. Since the queen bee's stinger is not barbed, she can sting repeatedly. And our drones, our male bees, they do not have a stinger at all, so they cannot sting. Well, we don't see the queen right now, but we can come back towards the end of the video and take a look, but I want to see if we've had any guesses as to how many bees we have in our hive first. So this hive, as you can see, um, it is double cell, so there are two sides to it. So there are a lot of bees in here, and if you do visit the zoo in the future, if you put your hand to the glass, you can actually feel the heat coming off of all the bees, which is really cool. They do produce a lot of heat in there since there are so many. All right, so we've had a few guesses. Um, Tracy guessed 8,452. Uh, Linda guessed 1,650. Uh, Chris is saying 2,400. Um, Jimmy, four or five. I think, I think there's a few more than that, Jimmy. <laughs> uh, Lauren is guessing 3,200. Awesome, well, I think it was Tracy, our first guesser, who was actually the closest we have estimated around 10,000 bees in this hive. So there are a lot of them, and that's pretty standard for a honey bee hive. So now, oh, actually, I see the queen. Perfect. So this is a really cool chance. She's not always visible, so this is really cool. So our queen is right there. You can see her abdomen is really big, and she does have that green dot on her. And so that's how we can just quickly differentiate uh, where our queen is. So she's going back in between those two different panels. So that was a really cool chance for us to get a glimpse at her. So we're gonna go outside to talk about the hive a little bit more and to talk about some things that we can do to help bees. So let's head on out. All right, so now we're outside the Animal Discovery Center. And one question we get a lot at the zoo is, ooh, <laughs> is um, how do we clean our beehive? So our beehive is a display hive, so there's glass on both sides. And our zookeepers can actually remove it from the inside of the Animal Discovery Center and bring it outside. And we can open up the panels, do any cleaning we need to do, check on the queen, um, get a count, a rough estimate of how many bees we have. And since bees need to collect nectar and pollen, they are free flight. 
So our um, hive inside has a port that goes outside. And if you visit the zoo on a day that is 50 degrees or warmer, you're going to see our bees flying around outside. So if you see that little structure, that little white structure on the side of the building, that is the port, how they can fly in and out. And like I said earlier, they can fly around two miles um, collecting nectar and pollen and bringing it back to the hive. So to help support that, we have a pollinator garden here at the zoo. So one thing that you can do to help bees is to have a pollinator garden at your house too. And that's really important. Pollinators like bees are facing a lot of problems right now. So we started noticing global bee populations were declining in around 2006, where beekeepers all over the world noticed that around a half or maybe even more of their hives were leaving or dying off. And scientists call this colony collapse disorder. And there isn't one reason for colony collapse that we've found, but it seems to be uh, around five different issues kind of all compounding. So the first, we can kind of call this our five Ps. So the first threat that a lot of bees are facing are parasites. So honeybee hives are susceptible to a type of external parasite called a varomite, and they feed on bees um, and just kind of decrease their nutrients in their body, things like that. It doesn't do well for their immunity. Um, Barrow mites can also carry pathogens. So our next P is pathogens. They can carry different viruses that cause things like wing deformities, which isn't good for our worker bees that need to fly around. Poor quality habitat is another one. So as we cut down, you know, different meadows and we grow monocultures, so all of the same thing, it just means that bees don't have as many flowers to choose from. Uh, pesticides are another one. So as we use pesticides to kill harmful insects that might be in our yard, it can have adverse effects on really beneficial insects like honeybees. And poor nutrition is another one. So again, having those monocultures means that there's not a lot of diversity in the bees diet. And it means that some flowers that are high in nectar or pollen aren't available to them anymore. So bees are facing all of these issues. Many bee species are declining around the world. In fact, some species of bees have been placed on the endangered species list. Not honeybees, but their populations are declining. But there are a lot of things that we can do right here in our own backyards that will help honeybees and our native bees. So honeybees were introduced into the United States in the 1600s by early settlers, but we do have native bees here in New England as well. So one native bee that we have that is a social bee are bumblebees. Bumblebees are bigger than honeybees. They're really, really fuzzy, and they tend to nest underground or, or in wood piles, rocks, things like that. And then we also have solitary bees. Solitary bees are species like mason bees, sweat bees and carpenter bees. So there are a lot of things that we can do to help these species and we're going to talk about some of them right now. So the first I want to talk about is building a bee house. So this is a really simple bee house that you can make at home that will help our mason bees. Mason bees are solitary and they like to build mud nests in hollow cavities. So we've built this bee house for mason bees just out of an old aluminum can that we've washed. They need a diameter around the same diameter as a pencil and you can use either rolled up paper like we did. You can use pieces of cardboard or even old plant stems that are hollow and you want to pack all of these in your can so there's no movement and then you can fix that can around three feet off the ground in a nice sunny location and watch it and see if any mason bees decide to build a home in it. You can also decrease your pesticide use around the house. So maybe cutting out pesticides altogether and using alternate forms of keeping um, any harmful insects out of your garden. That will help bees and lots of other beneficial insects as well. And you can also plant native plants. So we'll take a look at our native plant garden here at Stone Zoo. So one plant that a lot of people seem to overlook, we don't have in here right now, but those are dandelions. 
Dandelions are actually a really important early food source for pollinators like honeybees. So having some dandelions in your yard really gives them a helping hand in the spring when temperatures are pretty chilly still, they're just starting to collect nectar and pollen. So those are really beneficial. We also have some clover growing, which grows pretty much all summer long. And that's really important for them as well. Busy day here at the zoo, so there might be some background noise. Over here, this gets overlooked a lot and is a lot of people consider it to be a weed, but this is goldenrod. And goldenrod is a really important late summer food source. So since it blooms in the late summer into fall, it gives bees a really important boost of energy before the winter hits. And lastly, I'm just going to point to some lavender. The lavender isn't native, but it is a plant many of us have in our garden. So it's right here. And this is a really rich nectar and pollen producing plant. And then we also have some hyssop. It has really beautiful purple flowers. It blooms pretty much all summer long. And again, produces lots of nectar and pollen for our bees. And even if you don't have a yard at home, Planting these flowers in something like a small flower pot can go a really long way into helping bees and some of our other pollinators. So I think now we're going to head back into the Animal Discovery Center. We'll take a look at our hive again and answer some of the questions that have come in. Great. Do we have some questions? Yeah. So Anthony wanted to know how long is a queen's lifetime? Oh, that's a really great question, Anthony. Thank you for asking that. Queen bees can live a lot longer than worker bees. They can live around two to five years and they will overwinter with the hive. Worker bees will usually live around six weeks in the spring and summer. Um, going into the winter, they will kind of hibernate with the queen so they can live four to nine months. And can you tell us some of the native bee species that we have here in New England? Absolutely. So for native bee species here in New England, we have our social um, bumblebees. They're really big and fuzzy. We also have solitary sweat bees, mason bees, and carpenter bees. And Tracy wants to know, I'm not sure if we know the answer to this, but how many different types of bees are there? That's a really good question. I don't know the answer to that, but I can tell you there are many, many, many different types of bees. But we'll have to get back to you with an exact-ish number on that one. All right, and can you tell us, um, again, just for those that are just tuning in, what some of the threats are for these guys? Absolutely, so some of the threats to honeybees and other pollinators are the use of pesticides. Pesticides that kill harmful insects can also kill beneficial insects like our pollinators. Um, monoculture farming, so having lots of the same plant without any flower diversity is another threat. And um, loss of bee habitat is another uh, threat to bees right now. All right, and we'll take maybe one more question since it looks like we are running out of time here. Um, what are the mason bees main job? That's what Joe wants to know. That's a good question. So they are pollinators like honeybees are, um, and they do make mud nests. So they'll lay their eggs in those hollow openings in um, that tin can. So again, pollinators just like our honeybees. All right, everyone. Well, we are just about out of time. Thank you so much for joining us for World Bee Day today. Uh, next time you bite into an apple or a strawberry or take a sip of coffee in the morning, make sure you thank a pollinator like bees. We get around one third of every bite of food we eat from them, so they are really super important. Make sure to check back at our page tomorrow at 1.30 for even more videos and activities. Bye!